you know, frankly, there's hardly anything to say. They're so great. Everybody was really fantastic this afternoon. Extraordinary talent, voices, and also training. I mean, the amount of hours that go into the preparation of any of these scenes, and not just learning it, but the language, the style, all of that has just got to be second nature by the time you're on stage. And it, you don't kind of wake up knowing those things. It takes a huge amount of time. And I was lucky to come to Juilliard postgraduate. I already had my master's degree and benefited from uh, more than two years of postgraduate training here in what used to be the American Opera Center and it had different names. Um, but it was, it was so important because that bridge between education and professional life can be very painful. We lose a lot of people in that bridge because they either can't afford to continue on, they have loans, or because they give up, they get on the wrong track, or because they don't have the time. They don't have enough education to get them through. And this is what our young artist programs are for as well. Um, so these guys are in great shape. Uh, any questions? Anybody want to know about the lifestyle, the landscape? Well, thank you so much. Oh, wait, we do. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Roles. So I think in the end I had a top ten list uh, that had uh, Strauss in the center. So um, obviously the Marshall in, but also Arabella and De Gräfin in Capriccio. I had Otello. I had, um, I had Rusalka very important role for me, Streetcar Named Desire. I loved very, very much singing that role. And, uh, it, and other premiere uh, things that I did in English. And um, Onegin was really a, a crucial piece. So these were all roles that lived in the kind of full lyric repertoire. And I started with Mozart. So a decade of Mozart taught me how to sing. And I didn't like it. It was <laughs> so hard. The reason I got to premiere The Countess in all the major houses is because nobody else wanted to sing it. <laughs> and Hungry Me, you know, had to do it everywhere. It's paying your dues. And I th am so grateful because I had I started with heavier repertoire, I would not have lasted very long. And it, it forced me to fine tune my technique. Yes? Were thinking about Mozart when you were Thinking about Mozart and Carousel. Um, I think, you know, Mozart, uh, because of the refinement and the exposed, all of the exposed singing right in the middle voice, uh, which, believe it or not, is harder than the more extreme singing that you think would be hard. Um, I've always maintained that connection to a classical style of singing because I realized early on that when I used too much breath pressure or too much um, uh, really effort, it, I never had the stamina that I wanted to have. And, uh, and, you know, I was taught well here, sing on your prince, don't sing on your principal. Sing on the interest. So it was, it was a lot of years of fine tuning that concept of not over singing. Plus it's boring. When I hear people who are over singing and just singing loud, I, you know, I don't last very long with that. I think, wow, that's a great voice. What's for dinner? You know, <laughs> yes. Preparing a role, um, well, in the years that I was preparing lots of roles uh, all the time, uh, I, would, I would do everything at the same time because I didn't have time to separate it out. But if I had to the luxury of time, I would work really hard on the text first. Because once you start singing it and start working on the music, it's hard to go back and refine the text, the language, the pronunciation, the meaning, your homework about the period and the composer and the elements that went into creating the piece in the first place, and, and character. And, and when I say period, I mean what was going on in the time the piece was set and written. So all of that takes time, and that's the ideal way to do it. But I had to kind of do it all at once, quickly. Not ideal. I thought there was someone, yes. Yes, uh, ideally you're flexible enough um, to sing something in multiple tempi, multiple styles. I mean, I, I think there, there have been productions w that were really far out, far w uh, against the obvious meaning of the text and the story. 
And what happens when the director leaves is that the singers kind of gradually morph back into the thing that they, that makes more sense. Um, but sometimes, you know, you're really compelled to kind of keep something that's quite interesting. And, and I mean, Matthew Rose, I just saw do an amazing Leporello in, in uh, hi, you're so sweet to come to this, in uh, Chicago. And you know, having that kind of imagination, ideally we can improvise in any given performance with each other. It's an ensemble performance. So he had an injury, a leg injury, uh, in the middle of the performance and came out in a wheelchair and finished the show and they all improvised together as an ensemble and I understand it was the best performance because it was so alive in that moment from the improv. So, but we don't often get to do that. We're supposed to hit our marks, our, our directorial marks. Yeah. Composers, oh, I'm so happy you asked that. I wished through my whole career that I had more experience with composers, but it com a lot of composers seemed anxious about working with uh, an actual opera singer. Um, and I just, I really wanted to say to them, my message would be get out of your comfort zone and work with a lot of different singers and just meet with them, talk to them figure out what you want from a singer and see if someone can do it. Now, I've had composers recently come and complain about casting someone who couldn't do what they wanted. Uh, and I said, well, did you ask in advance? Did you hear them in advance? You know, this is what I would recommend is a little bit more experimentation and communication with singers, whether it's straight tone or extreme pitches or extreme dynamics, uh, try it out work with a couple of different people and you'll develop um, a sense of what's possible. I also keep a dialogue with the composer. If I get a piece, I don't take it as finished. I say, well, actually, for my voice, could we do X, Y, and Z? Could we kind of adapt this? And in the case of Streetcar, I asked Andre Previn if I could have a lot more high notes and some glamor in the part. Of course, he completely went overboard with that, but, <laughs> that's, but then I had to do it because I asked for it. So, uh, but I, I, the communication is what's magical between the creator and the interpreter. And there is creation in interpretation. That is what we get to contribute. So how do we sing that? How do we shape it? How do we phrase? Um, where do we add a portamento and how do we act it? That's, that's our contribution. Um, and it's, I've had the joy of having composers say, you did it better than I had imagined it or than I had thought was possible, and you made me think of, oh, may I should have done this or that. So that's a wonderful relationship. Yes? Uh, what is the difference between dramatic and dramatic crossover? Um, crossover, so in whether it's, um, uh, well, so whether it's on Broadway or, you know, in musical theater or, or in any cases, how to use a mic, microphone, because, I mean, I had jazz experience as a, a young singer so that I, I did have mic technique, thank goodness, but that's, that's something any of you who are thinking about trying other styles, you know, if there isn't a sort of some sort of system in Juilliard that you can play with and you can learn from, also understanding what to ask for in sound. You know, I often have to say, I'd like it a little darker. You know, could you take the high gain off of that sound? Could you make it less bright? Uh, because, you know, people don't know my voice if I get in a new hall. I was just asked last week, actually, on the road and on tour, if I wanted music played before the recital started. <laughs> I went, oh, like a rock concert. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know, that was kind of interesting. Okay, we're all done. Thank you so much. Thank you.